going to share a song with you today that the Lord brought to my mind. It goes right along with what I'm preaching today. I wrote this a number of years ago. I pray it will bless your heart. Of 
flowing from the throne. Yes. Welcome you once again to Life Church. We have had an awesome time of worship here this morning. God's presence has been very, very real. We've partaken of communion together. Now, having just sung that song, Flowing from the Throne, I want to preach on the subject today, Come Boldly to the Throne. Come Boldly. To the throne. If you have your Bibles, I'm reading a text verse today from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says, therefore, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and, and find grace to help in time of need. I want you to hear it again. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name today that this would be a morning of spirit-led revelation. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to understand <clears throat> what it means and how to come boldly to your throne that we might find mercy and grace. We need it in our lives. We need to be able to minister it and share it with others, Lord. So do your work in us today, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now let me just say a few things which are pretty simple. All prayer is an approach to the throne of God. Prayer is not a trivial or a casual act, but it's an amazing privilege. We must not take it lightly. God permits us, gives us access through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the cleansing of our sins he gives us access to the very seat of His glory, His throne. Paul says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. The whole foundation of prayer is that God has given every born-again believer constant, anytime, instant access to His throne, the throne of his glory. Oh, I hope you're getting this. And that he desires for you and me through prayer to take a responsible and an active role in the concerns of his kingdom. In other words, calling his will into this earth. We were taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We must always remember that we are approaching the sovereign God, ruler, creator of the universes. All that exists. Anything, everything. He is seated in majesty beyond our ability to comprehend to even imagine, he is on a throne. And this picture is real. It's not just symbolic. Huh. You and I, as believers, <clears throat> are kingdom officials. Did you know that? That's right. We are coming to the king on kingdom business, we are coming. Oftentimes, 
with urgent prayer. People are in need. Situations and circumstances must be changed, reversed, powerfully impacted through prevailing prayer. But there's another thing I want you to see. As you come to the throne, you need to remember how loved we are. Did you hear me? How loved we are. How awaited we are. How welcome we are in His presence. We disappoint our Heavenly Father if we do not come often, if we do not come openly and with freedom and even with boldness, and we'll talk about that a little more <clears throat> in a moment, but we, we disappoint our Savior who paid such a price that we could come to the Father, that we could come to the throne if we do not come asking in His name then we are missing part of our privilege and certainly part of the reason that he died to give us that entree to his throne. Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, longs to amen our prayers. Now, I'm going to say that again because I'm not sure you understood what I meant by that. I said our Savior who, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever lives to make intercession for us, he longs to amen our prayers, ask in his name. Did you know that Revelation 3.14 says that he is the amen? Did you know that? Let me read it to you. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things saith, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So I say again, Jesus Christ, the Amen, longs to Amen our prayers as we intercede before the throne of God. I want to talk to you quickly, just for a few minutes. I don't have time to belabor each point very much but I'll give you some scriptures so you know that it's truth from God's word. I want to talk to you about how, how we should approach the throne. First of all, we should approach the throne of God knowing and remembering that it is a throne of grace. Now, most of us understand best definition we probably have for grace is the unmerited favor. Not earned, not deserved, not works, unmerited. It is a throne of grace. In our text, he says, come boldly unto the throne of grace, the throne of unmerited favor, that we may obtain mercy and find Grace, unmerited favor to help in time of need. Psalm 89, verse 14 lets us know that justice is the foundation. Let me read you the verse. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. But it's not just the throne of justice or we wouldn't have a chance, would we? It's the throne of grace. It's founded upon justice and judgment. But we come to the throne of grace. Ah, how exciting is that? It's the throne of grace because the Bible tells us that God is the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace who has called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He is the God of all grace. His Spirit, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 29, refers to the Spirit of grace. Twelve times the Bible talks about the grace of our Lord Jesus. We live <clears throat> in the day of grace. We live in a day of grace. 
When the apostle tells us that during this day of grace, unmerited favor, he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Did you hear me? No one should perish. Not willing that any should perish. It's his desire that all should come unto repentance. And it's because of God's grace that his throne is open and available, accessible to people like you and me who are not perfect, but we have unmerited favor. Oh, thank you, God. Secondly, I tell you, we should be approaching the throne with a confident boldness. There is a word, a Greek word, parousia, that is used in our text today for the word that is translated boldly. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Parousia in the Greek means this. Freedom, unreserved speech, the absence of fear in speaking boldly. That's what that word means. Freedom, unreserved speech, the absence of fear in speaking boldly. And this is the boldness that God wants you and I, he wants to see in us when we enter into his presence. Now, let me make it clear. This is not self-confidence. This is not arrogance. This is not confidence in the flesh or how good I am or how perfect I've been. This is not about works of human righteousness. This is confidence in God, in His grace, in His mercy, in the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. When our King urges us to come and make our requests known, why should we hesitate? Why should we fear? Why should we doubt? Let me give you some scriptures. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful, full of care. Most of the translations these days say anxious or worried. Be full of care for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. He's talking about prayer. Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious. You're coming to the throne of grace. You can come with confidence. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Right? Right? But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He does. He prays through us. And the Father hears our heart as the Spirit prays through us. Sometimes we can only cry. Sometimes we can only say, God, I don't know, but you know. Sometimes there's a groaning within us. But the Holy Spirit can translate that and say, Father, this is exactly what I need today. Whew, hallelujah. And the Lord Jesus himself, the one who suffered and died, that you and I might come to the Father, that we might have access to his throne, is inviting you and I to join with him in intercession before the Father's throne. Why should we hesitate? Why should we fear? He says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Let me say also, I think this would be number three. <laughs> Approach the throne with openness and with sincerity. Remember the word parousia, freedom, unreserved speech? The all-seeing eye of God 
knows every aspect. He knows everything to do with the need that you are going to bring before his throne, before you ever ask it. You say, well, what's the point? Fellowship. Fellowship. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to trust him. Come with openness. Come with a sincere heart. He knows how what you're asking will influence his royal kingdom purposes. And he knows how urgent it is. Very urgent. He knows all about it. But he wants you. He knows the reasons why the need is there. But he wants you and I to share our hearts openly, fully, unreservedly, not hiding, not hesitating, not holding anything back. Do you remember what happened? And uh, there's a verse I'll read to you in a moment from Isaiah 37, 14. But Hezekiah is a king in the Old Testament, godly man. And he's literally surrounded by the enemy, and they have won all their other battles everywhere they are gone. And they're saying, you don't stand a chance before us. Why don't you just give up and come out? And they send him a letter by the hand of a messenger. And this is what it says, Isaiah 37, 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. You don't think God knows what's in that letter? Sure he does. He knows everything. But listen to what Hezekiah did. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Now I'm going to stop reading there, but I'm going to tell you what he did. What is he say? Look, Father, see what they're saying. They're not putting me down, they're saying you can't win this battle. They're saying they're more powerful than you. They're saying we don't have a chance because we're trusting you. He read the letter to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. You and I should approach with openness. We need to lay it all out there. You can tell God your fears. Yeah, and he'll tell you to fear not. That's right. Did you know there's 300, I think it's 366 places in the Bible where it says fear not? One for every day of the year plus, right? <clears throat> Amen. The more fully that you and I share the situations that we're dealing with with the Lord, the more easily and quickly, I should say, we will be able to prevail in prayer. Open your heart. i got to keep going. <clears throat> Pardon me. Approach the throne with faith. Okay? Boldness, faith, assurance. Remember it's a throne of grace. What does Hebrews 11.6 tell us? Without faith. It is impossible to please him. Do you want to please the Father when you come before his throne? Do you want him to say about you, well, this is one of my children in whom I'm well pleased? Without faith, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, now, just real quickly, not that he used to be or he's going to be, he must believe that he is. That's a present tense word. The Bible declares that he is God and he changes not. Amen? The same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows the past. He knows the future. If you will, he's still in the past. He's already at the end of time. We are locked into time, not God. He is not in time like we are. We have to come to him believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I'll tell you, friend, if you will think about it today, this is what's influencing your prayer life. You're coming to God 
whether you want to admit it or not, if you believe he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, you will diligently seek him. If you don't believe, if you think that your prayers are just, oh yeah, I pray a little, you know, and so forth. But if you don't think you're going to get an answer, you won't diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh unto God must believe that he is right now the God of your current present tense situation and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. A throne is the place where rules and laws and kingdom authority is exercised. Decrees are made. The king makes decisions. Royal answers are given. His decrees are established. I want you to remember something. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. We do not come like a homeless beggar looking for scraps and crumbs, whatever might fall from the table, not praying for a leftover. We come as members of the royal family. Hallelujah. We are officials, if you will, of the king's court. We come as a kingdom partner. You come as the prayer partner of the king's firstborn son. Whew. Did you hear that? I said you come as a prayer partner of the king's firstborn son. During the days of the Persian Empire, long ago, only the most privileged of the nobility were permitted to stand in the presence of the king. And even then, only a few at a time. It was considered the highest privilege any human being could have to come before the king. Yet you and I, that was an earthly king, yet you and I, we are given permanent, ongoing, instant, anytime access to the throne room of the king of the universe. Ooh. Not the king of Persia, the king of Babylonia, the king of the universe. And we are not only invited to come and ask of him, we are told to come and ask. John 16, 24, Jesus said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask. That's an instruction. Ask, and you shall receive that your joy be full. Consider the faith. I'm saying really faith. Consider the faith that it takes for a poor or a homeless person to go stand on a street corner with a sign believing that total strangers will give them something to help them. They'll give them some of their hard-earned money or something to eat to help them just because they're asking Anything helps, right? You've seen the signs. If they can have faith to ask for help from other human beings, total strangers, how much more can we, with what Romans 8, 17 calls heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, do you know who you are? When you come into the throne room, do you know you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ? Woo! And we're coming, praying, not our will, Lord. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Oh, hallelujah. We come praying for that which will advance his kingdom purposes. And I'm going to wrap this up. One more thing. We should approach the throne with these things in our heart. Love, 
gratitude, thankfulness, and joy. God is your Father in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This Father loves you. He sent his only begotten Son to die for you. He has made you part of his family. Come with love. Come with gratitude. Remember his goodness, his faithfulness to you. Remember that he loved you when you were not lovely and you didn't love him. We love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. Thank him for sending Jesus to save you from your sin and to give you eternal life. But approach the throne not only with love and gratitude, but also with joy, because you are privileged. You have instant access to God's presence, and you are welcome at his throne through no merit whatsoever of your own. Not by works, by grace. Hallelujah. Approach the throne with joy because it's a throne of grace. Approach with joy because of the great and precious promises. 2 Peter 1.4, the Bible says great and precious promises. Amen. He's given them to us, to all who believe. Approach with joy. You and I have been allowed to play an important part in his eternal purposes, calling into this earth the thing God longs to do, your kingdom, your will. Hallelujah. Even though he desires to do what we're asking, many times he does not ask, act until someone asks, until someone prays. He is leaving that to us. Approach with joy because you have the privilege of making God's heart glad. He longs for fellowship and communion with his children. I could go on and on, but I'm going to close. I think you've got the idea today, right? You can always listen to it again on YouTube this week. It would be audacious, even blasphemous, for anyone to suggest or claim the type of privileges and rights that I am talking about and presenting today if God's own inspired word did not teach it so clearly. This is what he tells us. This is what he wants us to know. I read you a verse, and with this I'll close. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did you hear what he said? In the ages to come, God's going to be bragging on himself and what he was able to do. And there's going to be multitudes of people in heaven that were not qualified, that nothing to deserve it that simply accepted the price that Jesus paid. And as I close this message today, I want you to listen one more time to the words of the Apostle Paul. Breathe through him by the Holy Spirit in our text. Let us therefore, all the reasons I just said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Father, we just thank you for it today, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for raising us up in Christ Jesus, seating us together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in the ages to come, God, may you brag and show off 
because of your mercies to us through Jesus Christ. Help us to come boldly to your throne in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.